Good morning, welcome, happy Father's Day, Dad. Hope you're having a great day. We're in the middle of a series right now through the books of First and Second Peter. It's a series called A New Normal. And we're talking about how we live as new creations raised to a new life in Christ. Today we're in First Peter chapter three, and we're gonna be talking about a new mission in marriage. And I expect some of you who might know me might already be rolling your eyes a little bit already. You're going like, right, what's this unmarried guy gonna tell us about marriage? But I wanna invite you this morning to allow yourself to be taught by scripture, to look past however you might feel about me or my being single or my experience, to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through his word. The words we are about to read are God breathed. They're in the inspired word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says they're useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. They are written by a man who learned directly under Jesus and was specifically chosen by him to be an apostle, uh, and, yeah, an apostle charged with preaching the revelation of God and establishing his church. These words have been vetted through centuries globally as being in agreement with the rest of scripture. And they have been guarded by the church locally and globally through trials and persecution because these words are recognized as being timeless and applicable to all who fear God. In John 17, as Jesus is praying his last prayer before he's taken to be crucified, this is the last thing on his mind, he prays for our unity and he asks that we, the church, would be sanctified by the truth of God's word. So let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God and used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. One of the key recurring themes in First Peter is this idea of our new hope in Christ, our living hope that is imperishable. A few weeks ago, we talked about how our hope directly influences our actions. Everything we do and how we do it ends up pointing right at our hope. And back at the beginning of 1 Peter, we talked about fixing our eyes on this hope, on our promised inheritance to find joy amidst trials. As we come into this passage about husbands and wives, we are still talking about that hope. The heart behind this passage, these directions about marriage, is that our hope is in Jesus, not in your spouse. Jesus is your source of joy, the source of meaning and significance. If you're looking to your spouse for joy and significance, if you're expecting another human being to complete you, you're going to be constantly frustrated and disappointed. And you're going to be placing a weight on that person, which will inevitably lead them to be frustrated, maybe even resentful. You're also effectively creating an idol by trying to place your spouse in a role that only God was meant to fill. But your most complete joy comes from living in the purpose God created you for. Psalm 139 says he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows you intimately. He knows what is best for you. He knows your true significance and he leads you to true joy. So when we come to passages like this, this is not about begrudging submission. This is about God, about his glory, 
And when we are acting for God and his glory, it will be for our joy. Notice in today's passage, the repeated use of the word likewise. This is a continuation of what Jeff talked about last week in submitting to authorities. This type of submission is not exclusive to wives. It is a Christian standard. This is even more clear in Paul's direction for husbands and wives in Ephesians 5. He opens by saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I know we are tempted to look at people around us and say, they don't deserve my submission. I'm willing to bet there are times when you who are wives don't feel that your husband deserves respect, or you who are husbands don't feel that your wives deserve honor. But we do this ultimately for Jesus' sake, not because people deserve our submission, but because Jesus deserves our submission. Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells us to have the same mind as Christ, who made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christian submission means laying aside our own rights in order to serve someone else. Jesus is our model for this. It is not a a sign of inferiority, but meekness. That is, power under control, practicing restraint by willingly and actively deciding to put others before ourselves. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not blessed are the powerful, not blessed are the outgoing and assertive in the kingdom of God, the meek, those who set themselves aside, who restrain their rights for the sake of others, they're the ones who get power and authority. In this way, we reveal God's kingdom on earth by living meekly in submission to others. And we glorify him by revealing his nature. Notice the reasoning behind each direction in this passage. It is not Wives, be subject to your husbands so that he treats you well. It's be subject for God's sake to be holy because that's what he sees as precious. It's not husbands, honor your wives so that you get what you want from her, but because that's what God requires of you. Peter says, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that they may see truth by your respectful and pure conduct so that they may see that your hope is in Jesus. Even if they don't believe at all, they don't know him, you're witnessing Christ to your husband by your actions. I know a a number of faithful, godly men, men who have greatly influenced my faith, who were themselves first influenced by the pure conduct of women faithful to God, by the way that they lived differently, the way they lived holy. One of my first mentors, the first people that saw potential in me to do ministry was a man who himself was first brought to church by the woman who's now his wife. And now he's a pastor who trains pastors. Peter says, women with a gentle and quiet spirit are very precious to God. He says, do not let your adorning be outward, hair, jewelry, clothing. It's not that these things are bad but they're not your priority, they're not your hope, they're not your value. Your hope is not in your own beauty, but in God. God isn't concerned with what you look like outwardly, not with what worldly eyes see, but with your heart, with your gentle and quiet spirit. As far as I could find, this is the only time anywhere in scripture that something is specifically called very precious in the Lord's sight. God has a special love, a special value for women who reflect his weakness, who have a heart posture that reflects his own. Peter says this is what distinguishes holy women. If your actions are following after your hope, if you're seeking holiness, it will be seen in how you respect your husband. Conversely, if you're disrespectful of your husband, that is a mark on your holiness. 
He uses the example of Sarah. He says here that she called her husband Lord. And that probably feels awkward to us because it's not really part of our common vernacular today saying Lord or Lady. But the principle is speaking in a way that is respectful, that is building up, not tearing down. When Peter says a quiet spirit, he doesn't mean that you're silent, that you never speak, but that you're not degrading, you're not nagging. Proverbs 27 verse 15 says, a nagging wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Proverbs 21 19 says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. It is better for a husband to go die in the desert than to be subject to degrading, demeaning, nagging. We know from James that the tongue can corrupt a whole person. Imagine what it can do to your relationships, your friendships, your churches, your marriages. I've heard another pastor say that sometimes Christian wives end up trying to fill the role of the Holy Spirit in their husband's life. You're sitting in a sermon where the pastor says, husbands, honor your wives. And on the drive home, they're going, you know, he's talking to you, right? That's you. Wives, your goal in marriage is to glorify God, to see your husband reconciled and subsequently sanctified, made holy, not by your work or your conviction, but by that of the Holy Spirit. Your contribution to this is by living in such a way that when your husband looks at you, he sees Christ modeled. He sees the gospel of God who humbled himself for the sake of redeeming us from sin and reconciling us to himself. You preach the gospel to your husbands, not just with words, but with your actions, with your character. Last week, Jeff told us that we should live such good lives that it leads other people to glorify God. In all of our relationships, not just marriage, but as parents and work relationships with your friends. Some time ago, I preached out of Ephesians 6 how parents' primary responsibility in parenting is to disciple their children. We as believers have a responsibility given by Jesus to make disciples. Often Christians throw around this word discipleship as a kind of a buzzword. We make us, makes us sound biblical, but we never really define it. Discipleship is the process of guiding people towards God, guiding people in sanctification. It can look different in different contexts, but the goal is always the same, to first see people meet Jesus, be reconciled to him, justified, saved, then to see those people who are justified, then sanctified, continually being shaped into his image. Not conformed to the pattern of this world, but transformed, as Romans says. This process of sanctification can thrive in close relationships. Doing life with someone up close reveals the areas where you are not trusting God. It peels off your facade and reveals your broken, flawed, sinful nature the areas where you are still holding on to your old life of sin. You come face to face with your own pride, your jealousy, your selfishness, your impatience. And then in this, a person who truly loves you will see those areas in you. And they won't shame you for them. They won't nag you and tear you down, but they'll lead you to Jesus. They'll lead you back to your hope, show you how he applies to every area of your life. But that starts with being meek. To have that voice in anyone's life starts with trust and respect. We take direction and correction from people who have respected us, proven themselves trustworthy, people who have built us up and shown genuine care. This is actually our, our vision for a church, uh, for our community groups that they would move beyond just being a Bible study to be opportunities for believers to do life together so that we can be leading each other in sanctification, calling each other to trust God in all things. But in marriage, this opportunity is ever more present. A wife with a gentle and quiet spirit can speak the gospel boldly to her husband. Peter ends this address to wives saying, 
do not fear anything that is frightening. A professor named Mary Wilson summarized this well, and she wrote that, such a heart of submission, ultimately to Christ our Lord, is a heart free from enslavement to fear. Fear cannot take root in the hearts of women who hope in God. In verse 7, Peter goes on to say, likewise, husbands. Notice that word likewise again. We're still talking about our new hope in Christ. We are still talking about how that Christ-like submission is lived out in a marriage. But now for men, he gives a different image for what that looks like. He starts by saying, live with your wives in an understanding way. The Greek literally says, living with one's wife knowingly. It is often translated considerately. Peter's calling husbands to know their wives, to understand them, and to live according to that understanding. John MacArthur describes this as a husband being sensitive to the needs, fears, and feelings of his wife so that he might subordinate his needs to hers. Humans have an inherent desire to be known and understood. When I was studying crisis intervention in college, the professor called it one of our most basic human needs to be known. It is something that separates us from animals. Animals have no desire to be known. As long as you meet their needs and you're not threatening to them, that's enough for them. But humans, we value being known, being understood. This is one of the ways that we reflect the nature of God. God frequently speaks of his desire to be known and then glorified. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, he says that more than sacrifices, he desires our love and that we would know him. In Ephesians 3, Paul writes that God's desire for the church is that through us, his manifold wisdom might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. When you know someone, it leads to a response. You've probably heard someone say the phrase, oh, I'm sure you'd like them if you really got to know them. When we get to know God, when we start to take in how beautiful he really is, how magnificent he is, how holy he is, we see his character, we see his virtues, we see his desires and the things that he hates. When we see him, when we really know him, we know how to respond accordingly, and we will worship and obey. When you know your spouse, you know her character, virtues, and desires, when you're considerate of her, you know how to honor her. Live with your wives in an understanding way, honoring them. My friend and mentor Sean put this well recently when he said, honoring is a lot more than tolerating. Honoring is an action. It's intentional. It takes effort. It's more than just doing what you really should be doing anyways. Often men will treat honoring their wives like, well, she asked me to take out the trash, so I took out the trash, nailed it. And to be honest, I haven't done a survey, but I doubt very many women are saying, wow, I just felt so honored when you took out the trash. When you honor someone, that person is at the center of your actions. That person is being raised above the rest. Honoring someone requires setting yourself aside for a moment. Actually considering that person and what would honor them. If you're successfully honoring a person, that person should notice that they're being honored. Husbands, you should want to hear your wife verbalize, I felt honored. Seek to understand your wife so that you can properly honor her. Peter specifically says here, to honor her is the weaker vessel. That, it's a little bit of a, a charged term maybe, but it's very specific. He's just referring to physical weakness. And it's not a derogatory statement. It's actually an anti-abuse statement. Because the reality is in, in most cases, husbands will be physically stronger than their wives. And yes, I'm sure there are exceptions. I don't doubt there are women out there who are physically stronger than me. 
but the high majority of the time, a husband will be stronger than his wife. So Peter calls husbands to honor their wives physically, not using their power to belittle, or to exploit, or force themselves onto their wives, but to build them up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, Paul uses the language of husbands nourishing and cherishing their wives, taking care of her physically, not harming her. Peter specifically calls husbands to honor their wives in this way as they are heirs with you of the grace of life. In this culture that Peter's writing into, women generally weren't legal heirs. In fact, women didn't have many of the same legal rights as men because they were seen as less than in some way. But in the kingdom of God, men and women are both heirs of grace to the inheritance we read about earlier in 1 Peter, to election, salvation. See, God's election levels us because it has nothing to do with our gender, our race, our social standing, our moral performance. We are all equally fallen sinners in desperate need of grace who have been lovingly adopted by the Father, who have been raised to new life, brought into his kingdom, and given a new calling and purpose. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is not to say that there is literally no difference, that there is no such thing as Jew or Gentile, slave, man or woman. There are obvious racial, social, and sex differences among people. But those differences have no sway on our standing before God. Our identity as children is not based on social standing, gender, or ethnicity. Peter ends his address to husbands with this caution so that your prayers may not be hindered. If you cannot be bothered to honor your wife, don't expect God to be jumping to answer your prayers. Wayne Grudem summarizes this saying, no Christian husband should presume to think that any spiritual good will be accomplished by his life without an effective ministry of prayer, and no husband may expect an effective ministry life or effective prayer life, rather, unless he lives with his wife in an understanding way, bestowing honor on her. God is serious about marriage. This isn't just a game we play as humans to try and make life a little better. A little while ago, Sean preached on Ephesians 5, explaining how marriage is a reflection of the gospel, the way that Jesus laid his life down for his bride, the church. That's why the way husbands and wives interact is so crucial. Further, marriage is a reflection of God's very nature. In the beginning of creation, God made man in his image to be in relationship with him, to worship him, to represent him to the world and bring further glory to him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes the chief end of man as to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is the purpose of life. That is why we exist. But the first thing God ever said was not good in all of creation was that man should be alone because God is not alone. God is three distinct persons in a perfect relationship, such a perfect community that they are in fact one God, a trinity. So if man was made to be in his image to reflect him, man should not be alone. So God makes a helper. That's not a helper to bring him his slippers and a beer while he's watching the game, but a helper in the work of being the image of God of glorifying him and enjoying him forever. God made men and women distinct. We're different physically, we have different natures, and we have different roles so that when we come together in marriage, Genesis 2.24, to hold fast to one another and become one flesh, 
they become a further image of who God is as a trinity. Three distinct persons who while equal in essence and attributes are distinct in their roles, how they relate to one another and how they minister to creation. The purpose of marriage is to reflect God, to see him glorified through the reconciliation and sanctification of men and women. As new creations, we have a new purpose in marriage, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Hey, LBC, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to stay connected throughout this season. Find different ways to get together, socially distance, connect online, give each other a phone call. We want to stay together in this season. If you are able and wanting to give, you could give at ladnerbaptist.ca slash give. Thanks so much for coming today, but don't forget to join us here at LBC for ice cream sandwiches to celebrate Father's Day. Excited to see you guys. See you soon.